Welcome to my new calculus channel. I am John Gabriel. In this YouTube video, I'd like to talk about the concept of infinity. Okay? So, it's usually denoted by a by an 8 that is lying on its side. Um, I'd like to begin with the philosophical aspects before I move on to the slightly more meatier concepts. And in the end, I'm going to reach a conclusion about whether this concept is well-formed or ill-formed and whether it has a place in mathematics or rational thought and then I'm going to leave it at that. So, there is a difference in the following two statements. Let's look at this first statement. There is no, there is no last natural number. There is no last natural number. That's the first statement. Okay. I don't think any of you will have a problem with that. The second statement is this. All natural numbers, all natural numbers belong to the infinite set belong to the infinite set called the set of natural numbers called set of natural numbers which I'll just denote as this okay so one is logical and hence true and anyone can see that this particular statement here is true okay now two this statement here cannot be true if one is true why because there is no last natural number and so one is never talking about all the natural numbers does that make sense? Think about it. By Cantor's definition, an infinite set is one which is not finite. Okay? So what does not finite mean? Does it mean A, no last member or element? No last member or element? Or does it mean all the members all the members are in the set N. Which one of these two statements is true? Well, after careful consideration it becomes very clear that A and B are mutually exclusive. Okay, in other words, only one of them can be true. Since A is known to be true, this statement here must be false. Okay, so all natural numbers belong to an infinite set called set of N is obviously problematic because we don't have all the natural numbers and can never have all the natural numbers. The infinity concept is responsible for many ill-formed definitions in mathematics. And so I want to look at the first one now. And the first one is Cantor's bijective cardinalities. Cantor's bijective cardinalities. Cardinalities. Something wrong with my pen here. I'll have to fix that later. Okay. So Let's, let's look at this little diagram here, a triangle like that, okay? And let's draw a line here which is half the distance of this line. So if this line here is k, yes, then this line here will be k divided by 2. 
Okay? The bottom, the middle line here will be k divided by 2. So in order for it to be true that every location on this line here can be mapped to a location on k, we must have k divided by 2 times infinity equal to k divided by infinity. In other words, if we divide, this obviously is not possible, but if you're thinking in terms of points, you can't quantify the number of points on any line. So we'll just call it k, the ratio of k to some very large number that we don't know means the number of points because the line is divided into a certain number of points. And if that's the case, then it must be equal to k divided by 2 times infinity. If we let, if we let k over infinity be t, then what do we have? We have a half of t... Oh, something's wrong with my pen here. A half of t is equal to what? t, yes? Which implies that a half is equal to 1, which is obviously a load of rubbish, isn't it? Of course it is. Therefore, it is impossible for every location on k divided by 2 to be mapped to k. The only value that would satisfy this identity here is t equals to 0. Okay? Because t is equal to 0 means 0 times a half is 0 is equal to 0, which is true. But this would imply that these line segments here, k and k over 2, are equal, which is contrary to what we assumed at the beginning, that k is exactly 2 times k over 2. So that's obviously false, isn't it? Okay. So now these ideas that we're talking about here were known to cartographers long before Cantor. Bijective cardinality is based on proportional scaling. Proportional scaling. Okay? I guess you could say Cantor was sort of a plagiarist by taking these ideas. So if a line has length p, any given line segment has length p, then we can say that p over n times infinity, yes, is equal to p over infinity because Cantor stated that each line has the same number of points or something called equipolent infinity. This would imply that 1 over n is equal to 1, right? And this is only possible if n itself is equal to 1. That is, these line segments are the same length. Does that make sense? Of course it does. Now, another mathematician uh, by the name of Bolzano uh, said something to this effect. He said, a bijective mapping, a bijective mapping from one line to another, let's say a bijective mapping from y to 2x, okay, which is the same as um, taking a point on here and mapping it to a point here, right? He said that a bijective mapping does not imply the same number of points in these two line segments that you see here. And that's obviously contrary to what Cantor claimed, isn't it? In other words, this, uh, this approach, uh, which supports Cantor's delusional theories, fails immediately. There is no such thing as equipolent infinities. And so we can safely assume that bijective cardinality is a load of rubbish. Which, by the way, incidentally, this leads to all of Cantor's transfinite theories, uh, the transfinite numbers, the Aleph zero numbers, the Aleph one, and all the other different cardinalities. And a lot of rotten theory has been
developed from these very bad ideas. Okay, so the next section I'd like to look at is the flaws in limit theory. Okay, so it is reasonable to think of, is it reasonable to think of the limit as a process? Is it reasonable? In other words, when you say something like L is, oh dear, L is equal to the limit the limit of 1 divided by x as x goes to infinity okay is it is it reasonable to think of the limit here as a process or a function well i think it is because what this function does is it returns the greatest lower bound. Zero is the greatest lower bound or the infimum, okay? The infimum. Right. This is much like taking the logarithm of a function. So, for example, if you had uh, a certain number, uh, let's say p, and you took the logarithm, the natural logarithm, just for example, that would be written like that, wouldn't it? Because those two are equal. And of course if you take if you reverse the process or you take the anti log, the anti log, then you get back to P. So you can take this process and then reverse it. Now in limit theory, if we are given F of X is equal to G of X plus H of X, then we can easily apply limit before every one of those, can't we? We can say that is equal to is equal to this okay uh, this plus that, right? In other words, the limit of f of x is equal to the limit of g of x plus the limit of h of x. <coughs> Naturally, we can reverse this process by simply cancelling these out, right? So yes, we, we, we seem to be able to do it in this case, but this isn't always true, as I'm about to show you shortly. Alright, so let's look at an example where this process isn't true where you can take the limit and then reverse it. So if we have, I'm going to make some space over here first of all. If we have, uh, let's get rid of that. If we have this, this equation here, one is equal to the sum from P equals to one Oh dear. From p is equal to 1 to infinity. I'm sorry, not infinity. <laughs> to n. Okay. 9 over 10 to the p plus 1 over 10 to the n. Okay, I doubt there are any of you that would disagree with that because it's true where n is an element of the positive integers. In fact, n can also be equal to zero, and it will still be true. Okay. We can rewrite this particular equation as 1 is equal to k plus 1 over 10 to the n, where k, where this k here, is equal to the sum, okay? Now since k is a constant for any value of n and 1 over 10 to the n is also a constant for any value of n we know that k must be less than 1 for otherwise this equation here would not be true. Do you agree? Of course you do. And so 1 is equal to k plus 1 over 10 to the n. Now, if we take limits over here, 
So let me make that a proper equal sign there. If we take limits here in this particular equation, then what we'll have is the limit of 1 as n goes to infinity is equal to oh dear is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of k plus the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over 10 to the n okay and that will equal to what it will equal to 1 on this side, on the left hand side, 0 0.999 dot 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 plus 0, right? But k is equal to this, isn't it? And it's less than 1. That's what we assumed. k is equal to this and it's less than 1. Therefore, we have a contradiction here, okay? In other words, um, we know that both terms are constant for any n, and so treating n as an infinite value, which is the same as taking limits, we arrive at this absurdity. So, the problem with mainstream mathematicians is they never understood limit theory, and taking limits changes the equation we originally started out with. So, taking limits changes this equation here, okay? this particular equation. We end up with something that's entirely false or not well defined. Does that make sense? Sure it does. Okay. Now, I'd like to look at just one more example. So I'm going to get rid of this. And in this example, I'm going to talk about something I initially discussed in my YouTube video called Newton and his fake infinite series. Okay, so that would be Newton and his fake infinite, infinite series. You can find it on my YouTube channel. So in there, I showed you how that a over b plus c is equal to a over b minus ac over b squared plus ac squared oh dear ac squared over b cubed plus dot 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 plus minus 1 to the n times AC to the n over B to the n times B plus C. Okay? So now, if we let in this particular equation, if we let A is equal to 9, or a equal to 9 and b equal to 10 and c is equal to minus 1 okay then we'll end up with something like this uh, those are equal signs there by the way I have to fix my pen okay and that's equal to 1, and if we simplify that whole thing, we're going to end up getting something like this. 9 over 10 plus 9 over 10 squared, dot, 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 plus minus 1 to the 2n over 10 to the n. Okay, and this here this here is the same as writing it's equal to in fact 1 over 10 to the n so we end up with this particular identity here and there are 
many of them that we can derive depending on how many number of terms we choose to have. And so what mathematicians do is they simply write 1, and I'm going to write it this way, is approximately equal to 9 over 10 plus 9 over 10 squared plus dot 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 is equal to 0 0.999 dot dot dot. They call this the par they call this particular partial series, this partial series here, it's not an infinite series, but they call it an infinite series erroneously and so conclude that one is well defined as 0 0.999, but we can see that that is not possible from this identity and the very one we started out with. If you throw away the last term, then all you have is a partial series, which is never equal to the value on the left-hand side here. Okay, And that's indeed what we have here, which is 1, right? That's equal to 1. Um, to summarize this, what this tells us is that there is no value of n, there is no value of n, such that 1 over 10 to the n is equal to 0. There is no value. All right. <coughs> now, taking a limit only changes this original equality. If we take a limit here, we change the equality. We effectively get rid of that term by taking a limit, provided this here is less than 1, which in this case here it is going to be less than 1. So to summarize this, um, infinity was regarded by the unbelievably intelligent ancient Greeks. Okay? They thought about it very carefully and they considered it to be an ill-formed concept and consequently rejected it. Now ask yourself, if anyone today is smarter than they were, what do you think? I sincerely doubt it. And so infinity is a junk concept, has no place in mathematics, should be discarded, and is not required even in the most advanced calculus, as I have proved in my new calculus, or in any other kind of mathematics. I hope you have enjoyed this video. This is a new calculus, and I am John Gabriel. Join me again next time.